to you. Good. So welcome to Negotiating Across Cultures, the seven mistakes a lot of businesses make with me, Matthew Hill. My wish for you is that you are inspired by this and have a subtle shift in your consciousness, your conscious style and your intention when it comes to international negotiation and that you have an impact which is closer to your intention. You get more of what you wish for. So in a way, you become much better negotiators. If I asked you to play, uh, fly a Boeing 747, a lot of you would ask for instruction. Ironically, a lot of the people within corporations that we work with seem to seek no instruction and just get on thinking that they're great negotiators. Similarly, when people go abroad, I don't need this intercultural training. I don't need a relocation day. I know exactly what's going on. I've been to two countries before. I'm always on a plane. I've been on holiday. And we all know that that doesn't always end happily. So my wish for you is that you have some ideas, some concepts and discussion points that help you to influence and change the outlook, the perspective, the, the point of view of your delegates in training. We're going to look at these seven ideas, cultural stereotypes, risk, dirty tricks, legitimacy, trading, lost messages and language, and finally trust, bringing that together. So I want you to participate, probably take down the odd note. We will make a recording of this, and I'm also going to put the highlights on the Intercultural Training Channel. A tiny bit about me. That stripe of paint representing the magnificent country, the Czech Republic, was where my negotiation skills were tested to breaking point a generation ago. I went over to the Czech Republic as a naive, young, diffident manager with a capitalist, libertarian background and crashed into wonderful people from Russia, Poland, Czech, Slovakia, Hungary and Turkey. They were the hungry, dynamic laser beam generation who wanted to shift forward after having the Soviet brake supplied to them for 40 years. They weren't buying what I was selling and I wasn't understanding what they were doing, thinking and feeling. So it was a bit of a crash and burn and I had to stop and I had to recalibrate. And I went through the journey that probably you train other people to go through. You coach them through. Who am I? What is my style? What is my send? What is not being received? Who are they? I had to get a lot of cultural knowledge, which I have to say was a complete pleasure in terms of geography, history and personal relationships. And some of the people from those times are very good friends. Some of them have learned to make a living for themselves. A lot of them are still doing it domestically and some are in the dizzy heights of international success and business. What else have we done? I do a lot of broadcasting. I do a lot of recording. So there's uh, an audio file. It's a five-parter on negotiation. I've written a book on leadership. And I've got a not-for-profit channel, uh, which is about the intercultural learnings of other people. And this will be shared on that too. More than enough about me. God, the ego of the man. What's the benefit for this program that you can take away? I'd love, if you're a company person, for you to stop losing money and opportunity. For yourself, I think we're never not negotiating, whether that's with teenage kids, with our partner, with our noisy neighbour. I say that advisedly. We're having some experiences to my left right now. Whether it's in business, negotiating for higher fees, whatever it's going to be. I'd love for you to start engaging and enjoying more international negotiation and cultural opportunities. And I see it as a prerequisite for you to continue building your intercultural mindfulness and sensitivity. So let's go forward together in that spirit. Can I ask you a question now, if we can get typing? So can you type in one sentence, because I have to, a lot to get through, can you type in one sentence now, what type of international or intercultural negotiation you are involved in? You might teach other people to do it. You might be coaching people from various places or you might be doing it yourself as a freelancer, as a freelance coach, freelance trainer or something. So do you want everybody, do you want to just type a sentence and tell me what is your interest here or what is your activity here? What negotiation interculturally are you focused upon? 
So type, type, type away, and we'll access that a little bit later. So we come to stereotypes, and I'm going to give you the short version. Again, it's my personal definition. You'll recognize it. Uh, there are other elements that I'm leaving out. To me, it is a limited fixed archetype which is used with a negative intention to make the speaker or the thinker, the feeler, feel somewhat superior and to, to make the subject of the stereotype rather distant, safe, neutralized, uh, unempowered or inferior. We can tell when we are hearing stereotypes, we can tell when we ourselves are using stereotypes, normally by the words around the tribal title. Every Brit seems to. It's the every that gives it away. You know the French. It's the the that gives it away. Typical German. A, a CEO who happens to have a German passport says that on a fairly frequent basis in one of our trainings in Amsterdam. It's the word typical that gives it away. So there's a cost to that and there's a cure to that. What's the cost of that? We don't engage, we simplify, we objectify, we rarefy a lot of stuff and we don't get down to the meat of it. So we missed the speed, the possible detail, the quality, the clarity, innovation, collaboration as equal partners round a table, creating opportunity, explanation, planning, anticipation. So self-limiting stereotypes or other limiting stereotypes are blocking the depth and transversal complexity of our conversation. It's easy to reverse it, develop cultural curiosity, listen to Charles Hamden Turner, and get on with it, open one's mind and explore options from the tourist or the, the whinging ethnocentric monocultural complainer to something more cosmopolitan. Why do we do that? The genius Daniel Kahneman explains in his book and in his Nobel Prize writing, a lot of our biases, the way our brain, our primitive brain, doesn't always help us. The halo effect where we find one attribute and we over-attribute that uh, property and make someone good or bad. When we're negotiating from it in a negative stance, do you notice that we, the accuser, are somehow not that wrong, somehow reasonably right and reasonable, and the other person is morally reprehensible, and they really should look in the mirror and have instant regret and retract their accusations. It's fairly crazy. It's fairly crazy. So we, and it looks at a cultural relativity, and we're going to go into that in a little bit more detail later. And putting these two together, we get crass little sentences which sound quite harmless, but are actually rather dangerous and sinister. Ethiopians are good runners. Frenchmen are great cooks. Swiss businessmen are always punctual. There is a small factual truth within these things, but they're universalized, they're generalized, and they're patronizing, they're very limiting in terms of diversity, context and reality. So statistically, we get that. And I have to say, we in the intercultural field have contributed to many, many stereotypes. With our large data and our country averages, we have produced, with the best of intentions, sophisticated stereotypes, which are stereotypes none the, none the same. Nonetheless, English is my second language tonight. So what is the opportunity? It is to go and treat these things as symptoms and then to drill down for cultural cause. It is, and you know I bang on about this all the time, to look at other things, unmet emotional needs, and to exchange more cultural data about preferences, causation, point of view. And you know the mantra, it's about self and others. It's about learning about ourself and our own experiences. Who influence us, influence us? Where did we get our baggage, good and bad? If I'm provoking you, write a question. If I'm inspiring you, write a statement. We'll have those, I think it's the end of uh, number four. So let's go for that. We're in, we're in good time so far, so that's all good. So keep the interaction going. It really helps me to, to see whether I'm connecting with my audience.
What I've learned as an intercultural facilitator over the last decade or two is the finger, the pointy finger of right and wrong, good and bad, better and worse or worse, don't really help. It's cultural relativity. You are either similar to me on one aspect or you're the same as me or you are relatively different from me. And that gives us uh, cultural reconciliation possibilities and negotiation possibilities. If we were all the same and had the same, we'd have nothing to trade. But it's our particularly colonial countries. It's the dominant groups which tend to be superior and make other people wrong. And again, linked with stereotypes, it's the failure to engage, which leaves value on the table as we leave the negotiation uh, table too soon. Or on a negative piece, instead of just hanging around for that extra hour, that extra day to sort it out like sensible people, we escalate and cause difficulty when there's absolutely no need. We are victims of our own prejudice, our, our vast number of programmed thoughts we're leaping to conclusion. We're missing the cause. We're not doing that. On an industrial level, what was the biggest disaster of the last couple of decades? Daimler, Chrysler. They got together. The marriage was odd, but everyone went along with it. The cooperation was ridiculous and minimal. I was speaking to a couple of their guys just a couple of weeks ago. The number of joint venture projects could be counted on the fingers of a small hand. And when the after the funeral, after the divestiture of the shares, the uh, the demerger, it was seen they'd lost half, more than half of the paper value of the equity with that failed joint venture. It's actually quite famous within automotive joint ventures for a divorce to follow. And guess what had never done, never happened. There had been no cultural audit. There'd been no systemic attempt at cultural harmony creation, or even that much um, crystallized looking and uh, recording of what the cultures were. So the risks are fairly painful. Where do we start? You know my favorite instrument of all time is Thomas Kilman Instrument, where we can find our negotiation styles and look at other people's. It's primitive and it works most of the time. And it's quite funny, the number of avoiders who don't know they're avoiding. In a way, they're avoiding it. So if we can, if we can capture our own values and morals, now you know that from a cultural perspective, but what are we doing about it? Etiquette, again, Matthew's personal opinion, there is too much banging on about etiquette within intercultural. Sometimes people think that's an end point. It isn't. Etiquette is the preventer of further depth. If you get it wrong with your handshake, your eye contact or your exchange of business cards and small talk. But it isn't the end point. There is so much more beyond etiquette. It's necessary, but not sufficient. It is really delving into the worldview, preferences, prejudices and where we got our baggage from. And when we do this, something miraculous happens. And of course, just that curiosity is going to pay a dividend. Getting on to the colonial, banging my drum about empire, a lot of dominant groups, a lot of superior um, ecologically or economically successful groups tend to think that they have a God-given right to be at the top table. And this leads to unethical behavior so incredibly frequently around war and trade and other things. And it's thought that the lesser country, the lesser culture, the lesser group, the lesser negotiating body won't notice, won't care or won't remember. This is so untrue and leads to bad feeling, punishment, publicity, negative publicity, sabotage, revenge or resistance. One thinks of the time bomb, which is the limits put on the continent of Africa and how they are not allowed to trade in so many commodities with the rest of the world. Just wait and see how that one works out. So what's it all about? It's about us learning some rules. I'm going to say something which is going to sound ridiculously obvious, but is not observed by many people. Don't bribe, don't threaten, don't steal, don't kill and don't manipulate. I don't think people have got that message or everywhere and in every, um, every concept. And again, we'd refer to Charles Hamden Turner. Recognize the difference respect the difference. And trade punishments are not exactly a metaphor, respect. 
and reconcile, take the best of you and the best of me. We have a lot to work with. So to me, that's the absolute junction, the crossing point between negotiation styles and cultural reconciliation. And if we can put those two together, then something amazing can happen. Now we're getting on, we're having a good time here. I'm racing away. I'm getting overexcited. It must be the large audience that I'm privileged to speak to. There is this concept of legitimacy, and this is a sort of lesson two in negotiation, not lesson one, it's lesson two in negotiation. When you put your proposition, when you begin the justification process of your position, then I think this because, and Cialdini talks about that magical word which gives random conversation scientific credibility. I want to bump into the queue for this cash machine because I want to withdraw some cash. Ironically, Robert Cialdini describes the fact that that actually works as a sentence and people believe it. So let's have some fun. When you were a child and your brother or sister had more of something, cake or sweets or pocket money, what was your realm of legitimacy? Can you see it on the screen? It's not fair, mummy. Can you rem remember back to those innocent and slightly naive times when we thought fairness was a court and we would be found to be the wronged victim of unfairness and the arbiter of justice, mummy, mama and papa would put it right. We cynically in the hard way learn that the world is not fair and it's not meant to be fair and we can give up on that notion except at democratic times of election or when we start something normally. The beginning of projects, we believe in fairness, but not afterwards. I'm broadcasting from London, where we have an obsession with the power, the universality of the law. It is a gen I mean, I'm generalizing, of course, but I meet so many British business people who really do believe a paper contract is it. It is undeniable and it will come to fruition that anyone that deviates from what it says on a contract is outrageous, probably from another planet, but certainly, certainly immoral, a bad person. Or you could take law to a crazy extreme, an ambulance chasing no win, no fee lawyer, an advocate in America. For them, the courtroom is a casino where they might leverage their charm or a business case and come out with a profit. So law is a profit center. What a strange concept. So we call this the realm. What realm are you in? So when you were nine years old, you were in the realm of fairness. And other people weren't. And that was shocking for you. Well, I guess most of the listeners today are in the realm of the legal world. How many people have reneged on a multi-thousand dollar contract? Probably very few of you. But we crash and clash into people who are in a very different world and we are shocked beyond. If the, if the, if the centric part is from the law world, how does that work? So people, a couple of characters over a decade or two may exchange favours, information, services, possibly products, arbitrage, trade, exchange, barter, swap. Gifts, reciprocity would come again. Cialdini rears his ugly head again, his beautiful head again. That is wonderful, and it is a locked-in private arrangement which produces quite a complicated coconut version of trust. Mutually assured destruction is the downside. A lot of loyalty and some, as I say, aspects of secrecy with it. But boy, does it crash and clash into people who believe in the transparency of the legal system. The deductive versus the inductive, the private versus the public. This can be very, very difficult. So we, as interculturalists or negotiators, need to go mediators, need to guide people through what exactly is happening. Little little example of when in expanding it to a further level of utilitarian benefit as well. Margaret Thatcher was a prime minister a couple of decades ago. 
and she was selling tornado fighter bomber aircraft, a lot of them, to the Saudi government. Doesn't matter why. Later, it was discovered that there was lots of hush uh, bribe money, brown envelopes full of cash going from west to east or west to Middle East. And this was seen, if you were in the legal realm, as illegal. But hang on a minute. Even from Britain within a European context, there was a different reality. There was a different argument. There was a different realm that came into play. Utilitarian or pragmatic benefit. It was economically a tough time. <clears throat> that contract would provide security for 10,000 working people in economically deprived areas of the United Kingdom. So there was a social or utilitarian benefit, but it was tra uh, traversing the line of the law. It was an illegal maneuver. Surprisingly, especially considering who was in charge, the second argument won and no prosecution took place. So society benefit, benefited, but reputations also suffered. So there was a price to be paid. So sometimes there are some surprising outcomes. This is where we learn not to judge by one rule book, which is the realm rule book, because you may find that someone else is reading out of a different one. So there are traps and ideas of false assumptions, miscommunications, weak spots and blind cases. It can be very difficult. And what action can we take? It's learning about your own law and not breaking it. Learning about the social norms, the business norms of other places. I'm being cynical here and it's not completely accurate. But, you know, 20 years ago, bribery was a tax deductible item on a lot of European statutes. What is acceptable for you? What is acceptable for somebody else? What is not acceptable for you? and What is not acceptable for somebody else? Those are very interesting statements. OK, let's see what we've got. Thank you, guys. I can see some questions here. Let us blast on through. I'll just take a few. Looking forward to the webinar. Thank you. Thank you. The slides afterwards, which we'll see. Just uh, we'll, we'll work on that. Some nice stuff. <laughs> good. Just race through some of these lovely greetings. It's all good. There, Everyone's wanting slides. So we'll see what we can do with that. <laughs> they are copyright pictures, but we'll see what we can do. Ah, coaching co-workers in the city administration. Very interesting. So internal, more of a coaching perspective, and I'm sure negotiation comes in here. This is the this is the description of what we're doing. Uh, do, both doing it myself and training, coaching others in connection, performing and enjoying negotiations. Absolutely, says the personal agenda, and there's the day job. I'm a trainer, most common in the U.S. and Italian negotiations. Wow, we should we must meet in Valencia, freelance trainer. Yes, exactly. I think that covers a, a multitude. Teaching students and doing it myself. Foreign versus Swedish, like it. I first on virtual intercultural training and leadership development and team coaching. Going to meetings in Russia. Good luck there. Do intercultural coaching. This is good. University teaching, coaching, negotiating with Asia. God, that'll keep you busy. It's a big place. Uh, teach, coach people in the future assignments in the US. Freelancer focusing on China. We've got some good stuff. Fantastic. I want to comment here. Exchange more cultural data. It's where I always try to begin. Good. Uh, but it's not always easy to know for the average person. They don't usually think of their own personal cultural data. Nancy, how, so, how right you are. Don't we find that when we've had a culture training with somebody, a foreigner in, in this country we're talking about, that they will actually know more than the local person walking down the street? OK. I'm having a scary thought about moving the slides. Yes, I am moving the slides. That sounds a bit scary. Um, but, yeah, let's see what, she's, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, OK. Um, actually, let's have a quick, uh, quick technical check there. Do you want to put your hands up if you're seeing different slides? Put your hands up if you're seeing different slides. We might have a technical problem here. Good. Phew. 
Thank goodness for that. Okay, so I think that hopefully that problem is uh, just with one unfortunate person. Uh, we cannot stress, stress enough the impact of stereotypes on our perceptions when dealing with real people. Thanks for elaborating this important topic. Good. Oh, I don't see any slides. This is all a bit scary. Okay, so a few technical hassles. Hopefully that will... Good. Okay, so let's move on. Hopefully uh, we're, we're sorting out the visual aspects there. It would, wouldn't be a webinar if, it were, if we didn't have some technical hassles, would it? But we are broadcasting this, so it should be okay. Go. Cool. One second. Good. Okay. So I'm going to go on to trading now. So tribe A lives next to tribe B. Historically, this is more anthropology or sociology. We have two choices. We can go and bash them on the head with sticks. We can make war with them or we can trade with them. So in a European context, the 1957 Treaty of Rome was all about the EU setting that up. So trade replaced war. It's getting a bit stressful in some parts of Europe, but you know what I mean. Britain, ironically, had a rather snooty and superior attitude towards trade or trades people, which is ironic because a lot of the wealth, power and privilege that UK still enjoys comes from slavery and resources extracted from colonial countries in the name of trade. The irony goes on. So what do we do? Um, so some cultural characters, you know, we don't like trade. I can't sell. I can't negotiate. There's a lot of sort of self-limiting belief about this, or it's seen as inferior, vulgar, rude, or a, there's a less sort of lack of faith about it, a lack of face, which is possible. We're, we're just not good at it. We're not competent at it. I meet so many people who are afraid to speak, sell, negotiate, present. It's quite extraordinary. We call it cultural modesty. And something needs to be done about it. So the benefits, what's it, what's it all about? In terms of trading, we would go back to the Harvard principle and apply it the other way around. So here we're starting with the, the, the principles of negotiation and moving those towards culture. And one of the, it's an interpretation of the Harvard method, which is to make the pie as big as possible before you distribute it. Culturally, what does that mean? It means getting to a place of collaboration, exchange and possibility, not just stopping at etiquette and certainly not stopping uh, way before that at stereotype or hostility because you're leaving so much unsaid, so much undone. What have we got now? What have we got now? We've got lost messages, and this is about language. So you guys know that there is such a difference between what you send and what is received. But let's just look at this. Um, so I'm speaking native British English. A lot of you guys are speaking a much better language for negotiation than I speak. You're speaking international English or English as a lingua franca or globish. That is a tighter, more robust language whose lexicon has been stress tested and approved in more countries and is much more effective. It's much more effective. So what we have is a level of uh, engagement which can cause problems. If we add that to the cultural dimensions of face saving, avoidance, diplomacy in the excess, that we can see that there is a difficulty, there's a massive difficulty that can uh, come to us. Having said that, also the, the cultural idea, have we noticed this? This is, a, this is a bit of a sort of elephant in the room. The rudeness of unenlightened people culturally to their neighbour, US, Canada, UK, Ireland, Germany, Austria, Belgium, France, uh, possibly China, Taiwan. There is a sort of cheekiness, not necessarily a love-hate, sometimes a hate-hate, a sort of rudeness, a superior-inferior, older brother-younger brother relationship. And that can be manifest in linguistic differences or a lack, of, uh, a lack of cohesion when it comes to understanding or choosing not to understand. So we have to be very mindful of language. My wife is a mediator, 
and a conflict resolver. For her, she goes to the nth level of clarity of purpose. So really it is about cleaning up our language. We do a lot of trainings where we now send a lexicon of technical phrases before we start a training or before we start a negotiation. This is massively helpful. So there's some hygiene, there's some clarity of purpose, and it's a good intent, especially if you've got a home advantage in terms of language, then you're clearing a space and saying, I'm not going to let you fall into the traps of humiliation or misunderstanding directly or on purpose or intentionally. I'm going to help you as much as I can. Now, we know this, but I just want you to think about this in a cultural context. Your intention as a negotiator, communicator, cultural person, manifester of your destiny, there's a distance between what you intend and what impact happens, what lands. Sender focused cultures are happy with clear, unambiguous, unmisunderstood information. A packet of data is broadcast. But there is sometimes less tendency towards the receiver. Receiver focused cultures. And this, again, is something which is not universally understood. For them, it's about face, status, continuity of relationship, dignity, trust. These concepts it becomes into a realm. There's some fascinating areas there. There's some fascinating areas. So we must know which we're dealing with. So that's a crossover with realm. But boy, how many miscommunications happen on a fairly frequent basis? So our job, your job, my job is to clarify, 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 to resonate, to check for understanding. So it's about active listening within the cultural terms. It's about definition It's going from a symptom, which is a word heard or seen and something underneath that, which is um, about a cultural cause or an agreed understanding. So the British formulation, you know. So if I've understood you correctly, and I really am not sure that I have, I think you are saying this. Am I close to the mark? What do you think, old boy? And you will have your own international English or your local version of that. And that could be very powerful. So again, at the risk of repeating myself, <clears throat> it's being more familiar with our home style. And it's getting to know the other style. And then we come on to the strategies and the tactics to do that. We're building to the big punchline. So bringing this together, really, gluing it together in point seven, trust. Are we in a transactional relationship where you fly in, lie, cheat, and manipulate, and wish to sign the contract and fly out again with a smile? A win-lose competitive smile on your face as you upgrade yourself to business class and drink Tom Perignon. Ha <laughs> ha, they didn't see that coming. OK, that's the opposite of what we're talking about. I add to the Harvard principles and saying a long lasting equitable arrangement where you can still face each other. That to me is a definition of a decent negotiation, a decent agreement. So are you ready for a punchline? I'll just give you this. You can you can believe this. You can relax. You can uh, resist this. Every, you ready for the statement? Every sentence that you offer to somebody else in a negotiation will either increase their quotient of trust in you or it will diminish, damage and erode their quotient of trust in you. Literally every sentence. Do you buy that? Do you not? And for those of you who in 2009 went to the Dialogue in conference in York, you will know that the components of trust have been crystallized as ability, benevolence and integrity. So we can build this into negotiation. We can build this into culture. Have you exchanged a description of your skills and expertise? Have you provided social proof or proof of your benevolence, your good or neutral intentions? And have you proved in terms of your reputation, your word, your promise, integrity? Are you a truth teller? 
in the wider context of that word. And to me, a lot of the work I do with conflict and teams in conflict is about the redistribution of power. I think that's about culture and cultural disharmony, and it's about failing and frustrated negotiations. When you redistribute the power just a little bit, then things move forward in terms of relationships, communication, collaboration, teams, negotiation, healthier deals, which seem to be larger. Again, we get back to the pie metaphor. What actions, and with due deference to the very wonderful Dr. Ursula Brinkman, this really is her formula, it's about raising awareness of what you're giving, sending, how you're receiving, your filters, your prejudices, your preferences. It is being mindful of etiquette, but again, not going too far with that. Etiquette is a stumbling block. It's not the whole answer. And then diving headfirst into a pool of cultural knowledge. Who are we? Who are they? Exchanging respect by understanding other people's history, geography, values, and everything else, listening to their story. And I must say, the more I go on and get grayer and older and longer in the tooth, more I'm moved by the single stories, by which I don't mean a prejudiced version, but people's narrative, an individual's journey, and seeing what one can see through that. And I believe bringing that in in culture or negotiation is a very useful concept. And finally, uh, there are many, the many competencies, which a lot of intercultural experts know very well, adaptation and accommodation, intercultural negotiation of difference in the context of recognition of difference, respect for human rights and difference, and the reconciliation, the, the gluing together of the best of one with the best of the other to perform some sort of useful, cooperative, collaborative synergy, some beautiful mutual gain. And again, I would go further and say, let's move on from the transactional, the one-off, the expedient to something which is repeating. Remember, in business, the most expensive deal is the one-off deal. The most rewarding deal is the repeating deal. So the best new customer is an old customer expanded without getting into too much sales theory with you. So we're coming to the end. If you want to type some more questions, I think we'll go through what we've got here. Uh, and We might have time for one or two more. So we've looked at the danger of cultural stereotypes on the negotiating table. You simply do not explore. The exploration part of resolution doesn't happen. And therefore, you're absolutely guaranteed not to be optimal in the size of the pie. The risk of our lack of awareness is fairly obvious. Dominant groups tend to think they can get away with dirty tricks. My favorite area, which is legitimacy and justification, just ask yourself a question now. Which one of those are you solidly in? And feel free to write a comment. Legitimacy hyphen, what is your realm? Have you got another one? It could be a different one. Scientist, you're an industrialist or something. You might be in a very specific uh, subgroup, which uh, the, the meaning of that is is for you. Trading value is really part of civilization and society, but so many people are too culturally modest to really explore all the options there. So there's a lot of work to be done culturally before we can get it commercial. So the idea, that one of the punchlines, are you ready for a punchline? We've got to have a cultural negotiation before a commercial negotiation. One more time, we've got to have a cultural negotiation before a commercial negotiation. Again, do you, these are my opinions. Do you agree? Do you not agree? And trust is this fascinating barometer of something, social glue, a brand of reputation, of integrity. It's a fascinating area. But benevolence would be the one. I am benevolent if I have a positive intention for your outcome, or at least a neutral one, not a malevolent, dangerous, or stealing one. 
So Q&A, let's go through a few of these. We're in perfectly good time. Have you got a question? I'll go through some of the comments that we've looked at before. Um, it's disappeared, but oh, here we are. And let's see what we can see. So keep typing, and I'll just do this, and we'll see what we do. I'm not a coach, but I am negotiating with Poland, Czech Republic, Sweden, Norway, and Austria. Wow, that is impressive. Okay. True. I teach in Finland, coach and write my doctorate on persuasion. Yes, I hope you're going to. Valencia, Eleanor, that sounds perfect. Good. Okay, so the slides seem to have broken. Hopefully that's back now. <laughs> Mid games is just a bit of a thing. It's just me. No, it's not you. There's a lot of people. So I hear. Can we just just, just quickly go there? Um, can we? I'll just put the, the votes down. Can we just have another vote? Are you seeing the slides? Hands up for yes. This is all really strange. Oh, that's. Oh. Okay. A, a, a minority of people are saying, I'm sorry, if we've gone to audio, I'm sorry, I'll send you the films. The slides are beautiful photographs, but you don't necessarily need to see them. Here we go. With regard to your point seven, I think people nowadays expect way too much of others. Therefore, they fail to develop a connection with the customers or clients and are not able to develop trust. So she would point to listening skills and being able to look through other people's eyes. And that is very important for a coach. Absolutely. So we seem to have a triangle here between being a coach, a trainer and a negotiator. Yes, it's about empathy. And I like that idea. And that stereotype idea is is quite powerful, isn't it? The um, The concept of... Um, I've got a preconceived idea of who you are, therefore that's the way I'm going to go. Uh, that can be that can be quite an interesting. Uh, ah, right. Good. Good. Okay. Good. Um, Let's just, I tell you, what I'm going to do is turn this thing off and turn it on again. The cliche, we might get some visuals. Allow me, we'll just flow with this. Let's see what happens. Miracle of miracles, something might have happened. Do you want to have a quick vote on that? I apologize for this. I think there's some sort of technical thing happened there. Let's see if it's worked. That may, may have worked or may not. Do you want to push your uh, hand if you can see something here? More people. Good. Okay, that could have been that could have been the issue. I'm sorry for uh, if it was it wasn't you mid. It was it was everyone else as well. Good. Uh, not everyone else, but some could, some couldn't. All rather strange. But there we are. Okay. Okay. Any more questions? Have I provoked you? Have I inspired you? What is happening? We can all go home and uh, and get on with our supper, or we can do something here. What do you need? I've just lost my question, so that's... So feel free, just, we'll just give it a couple minutes. If anyone wants to write another question... Apologies for that. Good. We've got some people who are people who will be in Valencia. So do feel and if it's been audio only, I'll show you the slides. <laughs> feel free to come up to me in Valencia and have a chat and say that's the biggest load of rubbish. I don't agree with anything you said or something like that. That would be good. Uh, Good. Here we go. I go to Valencia via London. What a great journey that will be. Great, great to meet you there. Train people in academia and business on persuasion. We need to meet up. This is fantastic. Lovely to exchange ideas. Very good. Okay. <laughs> 
<laughs> the frustration and relief is pouring out as I get a lot of messages about slides. Good, 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 good. Show me the slides then in Valencia. Very good. Okay, so it seems like that's that. Thank you, guys. Let's let's quit while we're ahead. You are you've been a lovely audience. You've you've given me plenty of examples. What I've tried to do there is give you some extra connections between negotiation and uh, culture, and you brought along coaching as well. I think there are some interesting behaviours there. To me, the idea realms was is the thing. I've just written a, a blog on that, and I might actually ping that out to people who've been kind enough to listen tonight. But well done you. So anyone's got any questions, um, you've got my email through the uh, GoToWebinar site. Um, also, I'll ping you something probably tomorrow anyway. But thank you very much for listening tonight. Uh, sorry you didn't see more. These things happened. Life, life would be boring in webinars if everything worked perfectly. I'll see you in Valencia and I'll see you next time. Thank you.